Good morning, software engineers. Hope you're having a lovely day today. I just got back from a walk in the woods with Sammy. That was quite fun. Looking through for ticks on all the clothes afterwards. Not as much fun, but necessary this time of year. So if you're out in the woods, make sure you are doing that. As opposed to my usual intro goof, uh, I thought I would give you something else to look at. So jumping over here to um, my, my browser window here, notice that right here I have something called Pond. Now, um, one thing that I did when I taught game design was we played some games that kind of bridged the discussion about whether it was a game, was it an experience, was it art, why was the game designed, what's the purpose of it, that sort of thing. And Pond was always a one that we started with. Um, the link is rjlayton.com slash pond. You can see it again right here uh, in the slides if you want to, uh, to go take a look. I'll post it in the comments as well. Um, it is a flash game, so you might have to go into your settings and enable flash uh, or you know find a way to download it from one of those official download locations. Um, but it's a super interesting game. Um, you know, it literally, it, it is, this is something we would do during class was play this game. It doesn't take long. So um, something I'm going to throw out there. Uh, if you're interested in other indie games, there's indiegamesplus.com. Um, there's also a book called 250 Indie Games You Must Play. Um, I'll probably, for some of these, I'll, I'll pick out some more selections. Uh, so if you're looking for a little tiny experience to play, something you want to come and chat with about sometime uh, when I'm having open office hours, that's great. Pond is an interesting one. Um, I'm not going to give uh, anything away about how the game is really, really played, but um, the short version is you have to uh, hold the space bar to do things, to breathe in, and then let go to exhale. And, uh, yeah. So, anyway, take a look at that. hope maybe you'll find it interesting. Today we're going to talk about refactoring and then go into code smells which sounds weird, um, but don't worry. Uh, it, it'll make sense when we get to it. So, this is not gonna work. No, no, I knew it as soon as I did it. I can't switch between different camera types to make that work. I have to go to the lecture slides scene, then click present, then it works. Okay, so software is never perfect. We've talked about this many, 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 many times. You always release software before it's you know, fully baked, right? Because if you don't, you're going to miss the market. You're going to miss the opportunity to, to, to get the people that need it. So sometimes you have to make those compromises. Now, sometimes those compromises are little tiny things. You know, it's like, okay, we're not catching this little case here. Maybe I, I, I misnamed a function a little bit here. But sometimes those little problems that you make, they add up. And we call that technical debt. Uh, that's one term for it, at least. The notion that you are creating potential problems in the system you're going to have to deal with later on. So sometimes when we're doing maintenance, perfective, adaptive, corrective, well, if there's no bugs in it, it's not corrective. There's no change in the environment. It's not adaptive. But there's a notion of perfective maintenance where the customer of that maintenance is not your customer. It's you. It's the developer. Sometimes you want to go into the code to make changes to it to make it easier for you to perform maintenance in the future. It's kind of like going back and doing a polishing to make sure that things um, will be readable by other people. I mean, face it, when you write code, the odds that you're going to be the person that has to fix it are reasonable, but not 100%. Often, like I mentioned in the last video, there's going to be a maintenance team that's going to pick it up and do other things with it. So you want to make sure that the code that you're producing is something you're proud of and something where someone later on isn't going to have to come and bother you to ask you what you were doing. So for your own sanity's sake, sometimes you need to go back in and perfect your own code for other people. So you've seen this before in patch notes. Um, we're constantly making updates to our system to improve performance and stability. Our weekly releases include numerous bug fixes. I mean, if you look at the patch notes from anything in iOS almost, you look at the updates, and most of them are, we are constantly making improvements. They don't necessarily can say, well, we fixed a bug where if you type exclamation point 77 times, it doesn't crash. This. I mean, they might say things like that, but often they're just going through and people are constantly fixing and updating and polishing and improving the code base. There's no good way to tell the customer you're doing this. The customer doesn't know. The customer doesn't care. Functionality hasn't changed. But 
for your sake as the developer, this matters a lot. So what are they actually doing when they do that? Um, they are going to go in and try and make it so that when you're polishing those edges, you're making it so when you do have to make a correction, when you do have to make an, a, a, a future adaptation to a new environment or add a new feature, it's easier to do it. So for instance, maybe you had a function that was just an internal function that, that performed some sort of you know, cleanup or, or process some data. Well, if you change that function, so now it's more um, available for other interfaces, you, you've now made an entry point for other parts to connect to the system, you've improved the system, you've made it so you can extend upon it later, but didn't change the functionality for the user. So um, we often don't like releasing the ugly code, um, but we want to be able to to pay off that debt, um, and, and, and we've all done it. I'm sure someone, I'm sure you have turned in assignments where the variables were X, Y, and Z, and you had seven functions when you only needed one, or more likely no functions when you needed seven. Um, my most notorious one, at least that I can remember from my education, was it was in my software engineering class at Wake Forest, and I was building a Java version of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Don't laugh. That was very popular when I was in school. Um, and I had this one feature that didn't work. I can't remember what the feature was, but it didn't work. It was inside of, a, of an if statement. So I added an if statement inside of that if statement to catch a particular case. And then it worked most times, and then it was failing another time. So I added another if statement inside of that. At the end of the day, it was 17 nested if statements. I'm not particularly proud of that, but at least it worked when I submitted it. So uh, uh, the, the act of going back and fixing these things is often called refactoring. Now we talked about this during implementation about going back and fixing these problems, but um, doing refactoring passes on full code bases is a thing that people do, okay? So here's a quote from Martin Fowler, again, one of the people who helped uh, design um, kind of our OO philosophies. Uh, refactoring is a control technique for improving the design of an existing code base. Its essence is applying a series of small behavior preserving transformations, each of which is too small to be worth doing. However, the cumulative effect of each of these transformations is quite significant. So when we're looking at refactoring, don't add or change functionality, only do one thing at a time, and then retest. So the idea is, if you have something that has that part on it you need to polish, target just that one little thing you're trying to fix, fix that one thing, and now test the whole thing. One problem that people get into is they go in and they change, oh, I'm making a refactoring pass, and they make nine changes, check that in as one um, commit, and say, this is our refactoring you know, branch, and then it breaks the build, and you have no idea which of those nine changes broke the thing. So you always want to make sure you're changing one thing at a time and going back and testing it. Backing up a slide here. The official definition of refactoring, the structured discipline method to rewrite or restructure existing code without changing its external behavior, applying small transformation steps combined with re-execute. Okay, so um, we want to make these, these, these changes to, to, pre to pre prevent the slowdown and degradation through change. So. It's a weird thing to think about that software decays, but it kind of does. Um, new APIs come out, functions get deprecated, uh, new um, better ways of, uh, of connecting to systems come out. And so you might build something that's top of the line, but as time goes on, it is going to decay. And it's, it's, it's weird to think about that. It's ones and zeros, it's electric. How is it decaying? But it's more of a philosophical idea of decay here, not necessarily an actual notion of decay. So we want to modify its structure, improve its structure, reduce the complexity, make it easier to understand, improve the ability for other people to perform maintenance on it or us to perform maintenance on it if it's our own code um, and don't change the functionality. That's the idea of refactoring. Now. If we say, okay, this is a great idea. I, I, Sheriff, I got you. I understand why we're doing this. What do I go do? Well, it turns out, if you're trying to fix big problems, like things that are gonna change a version number, like we talked about from the previous video, the X, the Y, the Z, that's probably not refactoring. That's, that's, perfect, that, that's, that's corrective maintenance. That's adaptive maintenance. That's perfective maintenance where you're adding a feature. That's not refactoring. Remember, we're not changing any functionality. So, 
we're probably targeting smaller problems in the system, something that's not big enough to warrant a number change, but still needs to happen. Well, it turns out those smaller problems have a name, code smells. So the name comes from the idea that, have you ever looked at code and you kind of want to go, oh my gosh, did you just write that? That looks terrible. You know, it's, it's, it, it has a stench to it. It's, oh, why did you do that? That's really bad. A good way of thinking about a code smell is kind of like an anti-design pattern. It's a commonly made mistake to known problems. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk about a few of these to give you some examples. So for instance, duplicate code. Maybe for instance, you have a for loop here, a for loop here, and a for loop here, and it's all the exact same code. Yeah, maybe I should turn that into a function. You know, you look at that and you go, oh, that, okay, yeah, that's obvious. I could do that. I could reduce the number of times that code appears. Another good thing about it is if you ever have to change that for loop, you only change it in one place, right? So that's what we're talking about. That's kind of the level of thing here, a long method. You have a method that is 150 lines of code and you do a whole bunch of things in it. Is that a good module? Remember that conversation? Is that a good module? No, it's not. So maybe we need to break that into two functions. Switch cases. Uh, maybe you have you know, the if statement of doom when it makes more sense to do a switch statement. Or maybe your cases, you have too many cases and you can consolidate them. You're basically going through and improving upon your solution that might have worked, but now you're making it work a little bit better when you have more time to think about it. Uh, data clump occur when you have uh, same things kind of appearing in the same spot. So um, let's say, for instance, you have uh, GPS coordinates and you have latitude and longitude, but every function that you are um, passing the GPS coordinates to, you pass latitude and longitude. You could make a GPS coordinate class or use one that already exists that has the latitude and longitude already in it to prevent you from you know, dis, you know, disassociating those two variables from each other as opposed to promising yourself you're always gonna change them at the same time. Put them in an encapsulated object. Um, speculative generality, that's kind of when you like, you over engineer, you're like, oh, well, I'll make a general person class that could be anything in the system. Yeah, you're kind of over engineering. You might have some of these in your project, maybe, maybe not. It's the scope of our projects are such that you probably aren't doing things of speculative generality, but I can almost guarantee you some of you have repeat code in, you, in there somewhere. Now, there are a bunch. Of code smells. I'm gonna go through a few of these. If we were, you know, face to face, as I often wish we were, um, we would be breaking up and going in, and talking about some of these. But I'm gonna just kind of zip through them, just so you get a feel for what a code smell is, and then I want you to go look at a few on your own. So, encapsulating a field, having a public field, mm, bad idea. We want to put that somewhere we can get it where we want to make it private. You know, this is a this is a day one. Day one Java lesson here. You want private fields with accessors so that you can protect that field to make sure it doesn't get changed. Uh, extract an interface. If you um, have the notion where uh, this, this billable idea is, uh, idea is something that multiple instances might need, maybe you need to pull that out so that you can uh, implement that in multiple classes. Here with extract method, maybe having... Um, uh, print owning and then uh, owning, owning, sorry, uh, with a print print banner. Well, maybe we need to actually make that another function. So print the banner, then print the details. So if you look at that top function, you have a function that says what it's going to do. And then underneath it, it has a print line statement, which is fine. But if you think about it, it's easier to read the one on the bottom left, print the banner, print the details. So you can look at the print owning function in the bottom part and say, I can just kind of tick off what all are the things that are happening here. It's easier for you to process as opposed to the top one where you say, okay, I'm printing the banner and then, okay, system not a print and you have to, you have to take a minute to read it and figure out what's going on there. Uh, inline method. Um, you know, if you have, um, that more than this is kind of the opposite to some degree, if you have more than five deliveries, well, that's, really simple. I mean, why did you make another function for that? That that that's the hey, professor sheriff said I had to have six functions in this class. I'll do this. Um that's that's extra that's too much. Uh introducing the parameter object. I I mentioned this as part of the data clumping. 
uh, as well. The idea that I have a start date and a start date and an end date. Let's put them together in one thing, so I don't have to always keep up with two things at the same time. Pull up the field. If you see the same field in multiple subclasses and you have a superclass, put it in the superclass. Opposite. If you have something in the superclass that's not used by one of the subclasses, push it to one of the subclasses. Remove the parameter. Maybe you don't necessarily need that parameter. If it's just today's date, why pass it? You can just get it inside of the function. Um, removing a, a setting method. If, if you have something that you don't necessarily ever going to access, let's just get rid of it. Re rename, renaming methods and variables. That one on the left is... It's like someone tried to make a license plate out of a function name, whereas the one on the right makes a ton more sense. So there's a lot of these. There's a lot of these. And here's some here's some resources that I think would be great if you wanted to go take a look at them. The one that I would like for you to at least take a brief moment to look at is our good friend Refactoring Raccoon here. No copyright violation here at all, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> although I wish he did have a... Uh, a buzzsaw wrist thing in the movies, but anyway. So this is this is a this is a really neat website for if you really want to look at some of these um, refactoring um, code smells. Um, things like a long method, signs and symptoms. Here's something reasons for the problem, like the Hotel California. Something is always being added. Uh, anyway, and that looks useful. Just saw through that refactor raccoon anyway um wow, that's anyway um lots of good examples through here trying to explain all the different code smells and all the different possible uh ways to fix it so what is refactoring how do you go about doing it there's just, there really is a lot of just good tips and tricks here to help improve your own coding so this is something that um you know we would typically look at in, cl in, in class and i want you to go and do this uh, on your own just take a take a few minutes and flip through here and look at some of the examples, maybe bookmark this uh, for later time, uh, something that, that you can re reference uh, later. Um, yeah, so uh, I hope you're having a good day. Uh, take some time to go play Pond if you like. Uh, I'd love to talk about it with you. Um, take a look at Refactoring Raccoon here and all the things about code smells, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.